right about the start uh, start class. So um, it's been a busy day today. Got a lot of stuff done. Really excited about engaging the students today. I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of cultural um, context, as well as we've developed our way of seeing the world. So how do we get our paradigms? And then what do we do with that once we understand how we've gotten our paradigm? So looking forward to uh, today's lecture. And um, yeah, please uh, join in the conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, go for it. All right, let's go. This is where the magic happens. So that I'm going to
Yeah, so it is updated. So we'll talk about all that stuff all that. your mercies, your graces, your grace. We know we've done nothing to deserve your, your grace. We know that you called us before we even knew who you were. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to answer that call. We thank you for this place, uh, Bethel, where we can come and learn about how to interact with the, the world that you created. And Lord, as we uh, engage in this process, we also ask that you give us the wisdom and the kindness and your spirit as we engage with people who um, appear to be different from us, Lord. And Lord, please give us sight beyond sight. Let us see the, the seen and the unseen, Lord. Let us feel your presence in everything that we do. And let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in thy sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So um, this class goes a lot faster than I, I was planning, so um, we'll, we'll hit the ground running on a couple of things. One of which is talking about the uh, removal and the assignments. So if we go to the assignments tab, you will see, um, for whatever reason, I'm not sure why the due dates aren't coming up. Um, and so if, uh, so forget those due dates. Yes, sir. I think a lot of the due dates were from that. Well, yeah, so I so I went in and I tried to change those those due dates, and so um, at least as far as cultural autobiography should be good, and I'm working on trying to correct the other ones. 
So, um, so just know that those, um, yes. I just tried that one today and I thought it doesn't open until Sunday. Until Sunday? Yeah. Okay. So, um, but those, those should be available in Zoom. There's not a particular due date on there, but only because we, um, we either get behind or ahead on the uh, on the syllabus, but know that those are um, I'm not docking for late points, right? So late points don't mean anything to you. Um, so when those are available, get those done. Uh, the first community event that's in the the Google, and that's uh, you'll see when when that is due within that week. All right. Uh, so there, there are those assignments. We'll go back over here to quizzes. Um, so the quizzes will be take-home quizzes. So this first quiz is called the context quiz, and it's based on all the data, that information, those videos that were in the uh, in that uh, in that section of Moodle. So watch those, pay attention to those, and respond to those. There are five questions. The rest are um, reflection papers, and those are to be a minimum of 500 words. Um, do, okay, do, yeah. I know what I said. So I don't need you to repeat to me what I said. What I need from you is your understanding of what I said. Does that make sense? So, um, when you said so and so and so and so and so, that I thought that was really great. Does that give me any understanding of what you got out of what I said? No, it doesn't. All right. So I want to know what. It, so, what principles did you learn from what I said? What from the lecture? What did you What did you get out of it? What did you agree with? What did you disagree with in the lecture? All right. So when we do our reflection papers, our reflection journals, I don't need regurgitation of what I've said. What I need is your thoughts about what I've said. Does that make sense? All right. So 500 word minimum. Um, that should take no more than you know 15, 20 minutes to do it. Um, do you know when people are listening to you? When you're being listened to, how do you know? What are some clues? So eye contact. Body language, nodding, engage contextually with what's being said, right? Um, I, I don't know about you, but my, my grandfather would, would say, my grandmother would be talking to him, and he's not listening to her. He hears her, but he's not listening. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, right, right, right. Have you ever experienced that from someone? Right. How does it feel? It's upsetting. What else? Not good. Not good, right? So whatever words you can put around that, not good. I do want you to know that um, even in our journal writing, I've done this long enough to be able to tell when people have really given good time to a reflection and when people have not, just like listening, right? When people are good listeners, you can, you can tell that. I can tell that also through, through people's writing. What might be some clues that someone maybe hasn't spent a lot of time reflecting before they started writing their essay. What might be some clues? Like what? Like, like that, right? So, you know, that concept that you talked about was really a, a really great concept and it really touched me. I was moved by all the things that you talked about in class. I thought those things were really powerful and they were engaging and I just appreciated how you delivered those wonderful things in class. What did I just say? Nothing. Nothing. I'd be a great politician, huh? <laughs> we're going to do some things together and then those things will be done by all of us. Right? No. So I can tell and you can tell. So, so give us some thought. The other thing about your, your journals is that they're actually not for me. They're actually for you. 
so that you can have some measurement of your growth and your development around some really tricky stuff. So again, in your syllabus, it says nothing in your syllabus about agreeing with me. There's nothing in there about that. Right? So you will, you will earn what you earn, but agreeing with me is not one of the things that has to happen. I hope that I present things in such a way that you'll, you'll say, oh, yeah, that does make sense. Or, yeah, I haven't thought of that that way. Or, even if I don't agree with that, I can't understand what somebody else is coming from. All right? So, so those journals are, are weekly. And just know that um, I'm expecting to see them by Friday of, of each week. There are 11, um, there are 11 journals. I'm expecting to see one a week. And someone will ask, like, what's supposed to be in the journal? What I will say to you is that we have three days that you can draw upon to create a 500-word journal. And it is about your reflection. I do have some guiding questions. So, for example, uh, what new learning did you have? What did you find profound about the information? What caused cognitive dissonance for you? And what is cognitive dissonance? People familiar with that phrase that the old those sets of words? And even if you aren't, you can deduct from the, the two words, right? Cognitive is what? Brain. Brain, what you're thinking about, right? Dissonance is. La, 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 la. Is that dissonance? No. Is this dissonance? La, 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 la. Uh, yeah, unless you're a grouch, you know, I watch a lot of sessions. Um, it's probably not melodic, right? The distance is that, that disruption between what you know and what you think you know, or the current reality and the new reality, so that's space. So what's creating space for you to think about um, around that concept? Um, how does a, a paradigm or assumption change? Uh, now that I have this now, new knowledge, I will now, blah, blah, blah. Um, having been exposed to this information, I will no longer. Yes. But I was just wondering, is there any way that we could have the reflections due on Monday just we have time for a couple of on Friday? Sure. I feel like that because I really could probably have on Friday. Yeah, no, I can do that. Usually on Monday. Make sure they're, that they're on that Monday. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So the reflections are due on Monday. When are you going to take it to get that contact? Yep, so um, I would say knock it out as soon as it's open. So let's say by next Monday, have that and your first reflections are so two assignments. It's not going to happen. And the cultural biography as well. Okay. Yes? So technically, this is maybe two of classes, but yes. we're working on week one reflection. Correct. Okay. Yep. And so, so we'll be sort of behind or ahead, depending on how you want to look yeah. at it, with the reflection paper. So okay. they'll be the Monday of the next week for the reflection papers. All right. So there's that, and these are other statistical things or things that folks are looking about going on. Right. So I'm going Yes. Um, 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 just for a second, Elena has a question. Let me correct her question. Well, I'm wondering, um, it's okay if we stray from, like, if we end up talking more about, like, one of your guys' questions? Yeah, okay. Use the guiding questions as a guiding question. You don't have to answer all of them. Okay. But, but for some folks, they get stuck and they're yeah. like, what do I write about? So there should be a, a lot of stuff there. And what do you notice? But let me go back to that. Because there's something interesting that I want you to notice about the progression of those questions. Yeah. So what's the progression of these questions? What do you notice about about the progression of these questions? 
what, so what, now what, right? So I'm moving you through Bloom's taxonomy. So as you're writing your paper, a, a, you can address the what, you can address the so what, and then ultimately the now what, okay? So that's, I'm looking for movement in action. I'm looking to see where you're moving towards. Right? Okay. That's okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, this is like, we have a question based on last week's and then based on what you do, right? Sure. So, I will expect on Monday that you have last week's And then the following Monday, this week's okay. mm -hmm. Your point is very well made that time for reflection for Friday. All right. Hmm. Um, uh, there were some questions about the uh, the additional readings and whatnot. Those are for you. Those are for you. Uh, they will enlighten both the classroom discussion as well as uh, provide fodder for your writing your journals. So. Uh, do we have to look at all those things? I certainly would suggest it. Many of those things were taught by the class, but the rest of those are for you. Um, because the, the, the needle is moving on some of this stuff so, so quickly, we haven't found a textbook that maximizes how quickly some of these things are moving. So, um, so we gather resources uh, so you're not getting a book that won't necessarily be relevant. So I'm looking at day two. There's videos. Would you want us to watch those before coming to class, or is that just you know day two happen? Here's some supplemental videos for you to watch. Um, I would say day two happen, and here are some supplemental videos for you to watch. Okay. okay. Um, the ones that I really want us to do, I'll, I will show. Uh, because for example, we'll. Uh, there's about three sessions, and it looks because this class is kind of weird, and that is only about 50 minutes. Um, we may have to break up the videos a little differently than I was anticipating. I was anticipating showing a whole video. I don't know if the 90 minute video, so we certainly won't be able to do that. And I also don't want to drag out six classes to show a, a three hour documentary. You know? so, uh, so we'll augment those in that way as well. Um, so let's. Uh, I'm looking for my. Uh, for yeah, quizzes are going on Monday too. <laughs> it's hard, middle school, like, I can hear everything. So, um, oh, here we go. So, um, I'm going to do this real quick to, because uh, I don't want to bore you, and time is limited. Um, but I want to talk about this idea. Do you remember last week when I talked about this idea that context is everything? Don't anyone remember at starting to have that conversation? Okay. So, what were the three things that I said determine a term to determine context? What determines context? Time. time. So, generations as well as chronological time. And time, how does time, what are the, the, the three movements of time, so to speak? Past, present, past, present, future, right? Um, some physicists believe in you know, other things and you know, you know other ways to look at time, but for the most of us, it's past, present, and future, right? Um, which means time is constantly changing, right? So I just left the the, the, uh, the future. Now I'm in the present, and just a second ago I just left the present, and now it's in the past, right? I mean that's how fleeting time is. What else? Space. space the use of space, right? So um, a hundred thousand years ago. This building wasn't here, right? And, and who was here? 
American Indians were here, right? So, the, so we we weren't. None of our people were were here, right? So, but how we use space and how they use this particular land was way different than how we use it today. And in the future, whatever you know, future Bethel students, you know, our great 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 grands will use this space way differently than we did. Right? So, um, I grew up in a time when there was no internet. My daughter was sitting at Smashburger, and she says, okay, Google, turn on the Octonauts in the living room. You know why that is? My daughter can talk to the internet, and it responds. It does stuff. Right? Anybody have Alexa at, at, at your house or at, at your parents' house? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, Google Home, anybody? At any rate, so, so my daughter can talk to the internet and it does stuff, right? So I grew up without it. And she's growing up not knowing anything but it, right? So the way time gets used is different. Space is different. And what else? Yeah. Yeah. Geography, right? So Decembers in, um, in Minnesota are very different than Decembers in um, Florida. Right? Very different December. And out of those differences in geography, some behaviors come up that are very different. So what are some things that we do here in, in December, January, and February, that folks don't do in Florida or Arizona? Ice fishing, sledding, plow wow. snow, <laughs> shovel, polar bear. Anybody polar bear? That's when you put the hole in the ice and you jump in. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not as basic as I thought I was. You know. Anybody know what that means? Oh, I'm in. I'm in. I'm cool. No. Um, so, but that big base is, is that cool or not cool? Um, yeah, on those oh, okay, cool. So, um, so, yeah, so all of those things are about the, the content. Right, so context is everything. Context is really important, and so um, I, I found it interesting that you know one of my favorite presidents was uh, President Ronald Reagan, and um, Ronald Reagan was an interesting cat. He was he was exquisite with the English language. He uh, he, he knew how to get his, his points across, and I believe he was very purposeful in most of the things that he did. Right? And so Ronald Reagan um, gave the speech to the UN, which was quite um, astounding because he proposed a question and his question was at the UN what if aliens landed on the planet would that change anything and what do you think about that what would be your answer to that do you think that would change anything what would it change it would change what but it depends on the type of alien, right? So, so what would it change? How we think of ourselves. How we think of ourselves. How, as, as human beings, would it change how we see ourselves? In what way? In what way would that change? How we see ourselves. All right, so we would recognize that we're not the center of the universe anymore, that there, there are other beings outside of, of our planet. How else would they change how we see each other? We might see how we're more related to one another, right? So that could be one of the things that we see. And depending on if the aliens are, you know, kind and gentle aliens, or if they're, you know... Um, What's the uh, first person shooter game? Um, where you're, you're trying to shoot the red and the blue aliens, uh, Halo. I mean, Halo aliens, right? Um, whether they're those kinds, it, it would change a lot about it, right? Would it change how we saw God? For sure it would, right? It would certainly change how we relate to each other. What, what, you know, what do you think the stock market would? It'd be like just crazy, like it's like you know, a wild, you know, a wild horse and just wow, you know, all over the place, right? So, so context is everything. And so when Ronald Reagan uh, introduced that 
that this concept was kind of born, this out of context problem um, is the concept. And so oftentimes when we when we meet new cultures and new individuals or interact with, with folks, what ends up happening is that we have an out of context. Right? So we're going to talk a little bit about some of these aspects of the out of context problem. So out of context problem is a is a is an outside context problem. It's a situation where uh, one society or civilization uh, comes in contact with another, which is uh, superior or inferior in terms of technology or development. Most commonly, weaponry, weaponry, and transportation. Usually, this results in the subjugation or destruction of uh, the technologically inferior uh, society. Right? Um, and, and why is that? Or the appear I mean, and these are all appearances, right? So paradigms of inferiority. What would be an inferior species on our planet? What would you consider to be an inferior species? Ants could be considered an inferior species. What else? Could we consider an species? Because we're the top, right? I mean, we're the top of the so-called evolutionary chain, right? We're, I mean, we're the top of the pyramid, right? So what, what might be inferior? Yes. Grass. Grass could be inferior. Dogs could be inferior. Let's take dogs for example. So supposedly, and, and again, out of context problem, right? So supposedly we're highly evolved, we're highly, uh, you know, we have metacognition, we are homo sapiens sapiens. The ones who know that they know they, they exist, right? That's what that means, homo sapiens sapiens. And we're supposed to be in things. Have you ever seen a dog go to war with another dog? You ever see clans of dogs go to war with each other? Never seen that. I've never seen that. I've never seen um, a dog light up a cigarette and smoke a cigarette. Never seen that. You ever seen a dog uh, go to the store, buy some, some alcohol, and get so drunk that he can't function? No, you don't see that. But he's inferior. So when we talk about this out of context problem, sometimes we apply values to stuff that, that doesn't, doesn't exist, right? Or or is inappropriate. So to say one culture is highly advanced and another one is not isn't quite all true. Right? So the founding of our country, um, uh, Jamestown. Uh, Settlers were there. Who did they need to help them get through the winter? The Native Americans, who were what? Inferior to them. Inferior, right? But we have to go save these natives. And the natives end up saving the people who came to save them. Right? So when we talk about this idea of out of context problem, we have to remember that sometimes we try to put values on stuff. Um, anyone ever gone to a mission trip? Gone on a mission trip? Raise your hand. Hi. Did in your mission trip did you end up learning, in your own estimation, probably more than what you gave? I know that's been true for me when I've done that. Right? I was like, oh, I didn't know the world was like this. I didn't know things worked like that. I actually felt like I got more out of it than what I gave. Okay? Because I was able to, to kind of operate outside of this, of this kind of place. So, um, so here's a good question for you. Why do deer get hit by cars? You know, ever seen a deer get hit by a car or a remnant, remnant? It's not pretty, right? So why do they deer get hit by cars? Because they don't know. They don't know that. They don't know to not go on the street, okay. possibly. Yeah. 
They freeze. They don't know that it's dangerous. Why? They instinctively need to go to the other side. So they instinctively need to go to the other side. Okay. Cool. 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 Okay. Okay. So cars are a whole lot faster than they are. And I think all of your answers were really great answers. Um, I don't think anybody ever seen Bandy. Is this the kind of Bandy? Yes. Yearling, the Yearling. Anybody see the Yearling? Okay, you guys see Yearling, Bandy, and like Sound, an old yellow. Have you ever, anybody seen old yellow? Yellow? Yeah, the classics. Right? Just good tear jerky. Right? But there was no point in any of those films, whether it's, you know, old yellow the dog or uh, Sounder the dog or. Um, or the, the, the two deer movies, Yearling and, uh, and, and, and Bambi, where book, Bambi's dead. Set Bambi down as the baby. Be careful of that truck. It's a Ford F-150. And he never said that. Dawn never said to Bambi, don't worry about that. It's just the Toyota Yaris. Right? That never happened. So why do deer get hit by trucks? Because they don't know what they are. They don't know what they are. Um, and, and part of that is the other part of that is you know we built roadways through places that they used to hang out. Right? We built civilizations where they used to live. And so deer get hit by cars because they don't know what they are. And this I thought this was a, uh, a cool um, little video. Yeah, you turn off one of the lights. Not sure why the audio is not working, but it's okay. I do think that it's funny that when I uh, when I, I watch this, and let me see if I can find it right. There's a warning. This is for this is a demonstration only. <laughs> <laughs> like they have to put that in a commercial. This is a demonstration only. Do not attempt this. It's right there. So. Um, People really say it like that. Um, so content is everything. It is time. It is space. It is location. Um, and so, what are the, the 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 three parts of um, what drives people? What what drives people is this idea of safety, significance, and belonging. And Right? And Maslow talked about them in terms of how many? How many did Maslow talk about? Five, six, or seven, depending on what model you're using, right? Um, Abraham, um, Alfred Adler talks about these uh, being safety, significance, and belonging. So you can write that name down, Alfred. Alfred Adler in human needs. So safety, significance, and belonging. So as a result of context being the time, space, and place, humans have been trying to get their needs met, given a particular context. So these two things have an influence, and the result of that has been this thing called culture. And in culture, we find some very interesting phenomena. We have this thing called a paradigm. And what did we say a paradigm was? What's a paradigm? The way you see the world, or worldview, right? Paradigm. We also have this illusion of knowledge. So I asked folks to, to draw a bicycle. Do you guys remember that? Last week I asked you to draw a bicycle. 
And um, what I'd like you to do is to pull out your, your picture and share it with your neighbors. And I want you and your neighbor to talk about your picture of the of your bison. <laughs> All right, so help me, so you've shared your bike with your neighbor, help me build a bike. All right, so uh, we'll, we'll do two bikes. We'll do a male bike and a female bike. All right, so so let, let's start with the, the, the female bike. So I have two wheels, so we're going to start there. What else do I need for this, this bike? I need some handlebars. A seat. Bars connecting the wheels. How do those bars need to go? Up. And then connect this back. So your bike was connected like that. Oh yeah. Oh, it seems like oh yeah. Scooter bike. Right. So so for the most part. Oh, yeah, that's Right? And then the, the guy's bike is like this. And chain. Seat. It does look like a motorcycle. It's one of those giant. You know, got a light on it. So, so how how functional is your your drawing of your bike? It's pretty bad, not very functional at all. So if you handed it over to an engineer, why is it? Why do you think that happened? Why do you think that happened? Because you don't look at bikes that much. It's hard when it's not in front of you. Because you have an illusion. Of knowledge. We think we know how stuff works, when in fact, oftentimes we don't. Right? And where does that illusion come from? It comes from culture. And so culture's job is to create your adaptation. Adaptation to the context. Or another way to think about that is that it is the method. That people create. So a paradigm becomes a method for adapting to the context. An illusion of knowledge, knowledge becomes a method for adapting to the context. Right? And then lastly, this idea of conformity is a method for adapting to the context. So context is extremely important. Can you have a faulty paradigm? Can you look at the world one way and not be that way? You certainly can. But why might people have developed that paradigm? Because it was passed down to them and the context changed. Right? Um, the illusion of knowledge. If my iPhone fell apart and they said, take all the pieces out of the iPhone and put it back together, I don't know that I can do that, but I know how to operate an iPhone, right? But I really don't know I know. Right? So, um, so there's that. And so I have time for one more. Piece and then so fast. And then it's time to go. So you get about two minutes. So so a paradigm is simply how you see the world. You get your pet your paradigm or your worldview from your parents, and they pass down copies of copies. Right? 
And so then you have this blind spot. Remember the, the pie that we drew, and blah, 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 and you have this big section here. That is also known as a scotoma. S-C-O-T-O-M-A. And scotoma um, is, is the same, shares the same root word for, um, for glaucoma, right? So glaucoma, so blind spot. Um, there are a number of illusions. Like if you did this particular illusion, right? Uh, and so you brought your fingers until they look like they were floating. Have you ever done that as a kid? You put your fingers like this. Try, try it if you have it, until you can see like little sausage floating in between your fingers, right? That happens because it hits a part of your your eye that creates a scotoma. There's a blind spot that you end up having. Right? Yeah, so that's a blind spot. That's what makes it look like it's a little floating. Do you see it? Okay, keep pulling closer. You got it? No? Okay. <laughs> He's like, I got no blind spots. I see everything. Right? So, yeah, kind of look past the fingers a little bit. Yeah, a little bit past the fingers. You feel like you see a little. Oh, look at that. Yeah. All right, so, so blind spots. And we don't see the world as it is, we see the world how? As we are, right? And what, what becomes our filters for, for how we see the world? Our context, right? Our context. So the US context has a certain way that we end up seeing the world. Um, so we did the exercise for drawing a bicycle. You know, how do we know how stuff works? Um, what I've done in my elementary, I used to do this in my middle school and elementary school class, is I'd have them write down the directions for making the sandwich. And then I would take their directions and I would make a sandwich based on how they said to, to, to do it and what they didn't say to do. Right? And so we have to be really careful about saying how, that we know stuff that we may not know. Someone asked me a question and they said, um, you know, what happens when you drop a, a drop of water in a vacuum? What happens when that happens? You know what my answer was? I don't know. You know why? I've never dropped a drop of water in a vacuum. So I don't know, right? And so a lot of times we, we, we take on things and we act like we know things because people have told us that that's what we're supposed to know or that that's what we're supposed to know. Um, so there's an eight-minute video I encourage you to look at. This this presentation is in the Moodle, so so, so please, uh, this, that, I think you'll find this as fascinating as I have. Um, because the other part that culture creates is this idea of conformity. And um, and typically we say things um, that we demand conformity from people. Is conformity good or bad? What's that? It depends. What does it depend on? Um, I well, the first thing I thought about was like a good example of conformity is like having people like obey laws for like safety reasons. It's a really good thing, but then if you're just trying to get someone to conform to specifically what they need to do, you can do. Okay, that's another thing, right? So laws to keep people safe. Good conformity, right? Um, you want to stay in your parents' house? You can afford to what they want, right? I certainly did. I don't know about you. Um, yes, and, and and so there is good conformity and there's bad conformity. And what I would suggest is that oftentimes people use rationales like because, right? Or um, because I said so. Um, I think right now we're in a real tricky position because people want to um, make people be patriotic. Right, so right now in the NFL, there's this big, you know, hull of a little about people kneeling or not kneeling, standing, not standing. Anybody heard any of those controversies? And it's, it's really interesting to me that lots of people have opinions about that. But I do find it interesting that um, a, a lot of people who say, you know, they're being disrespectful by not standing for the national anthem. I think that's interesting because as the national anthem is playing in your home, I don't see people standing and putting their hands over their heart and taking off their hats 
So isn't that disrespectful as well to sit at home for all this? You know, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's interesting, right? Um, and then to, to force people to believe things, whether you believe that they're right or wrong or not, right? So what's the great thing about uh, God's love for us? Okay, here, 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 let me back it up even further. Why did God put the tree of good and evil in the garden in the first place? Because they have a choice, right? So, so our belief system is that the ultimate love comes because you made that choice, right? So we don't try to, you know, browbeat people and the, and those people who have done that have been wrong because it is all about choice. Um, and then conformity is about what they did, and uh, that's the way it's always been. Uh, this is a, uh, a video from uh, Stanley Milgram. Is anyone familiar with the Milgram experiment? Okay. Um, please watch that. I think you'll find it pretty enlightening about what happened or uh, engaging about what happens when we have negative conformity. Right? When we try to make people do things that they don't necessarily see as valuable or how easy it is to coerce people into doing things that work against their own best interests. Right? Um, just a couple more things, and then we're out of here. Um, so, yeah, ultimately, it's your responsibility to start placing things in context. You are responsible for how you think, how you move, what you do. You are ultimately responsible, not only to yourself, but to the community at large, right? So, put things in context. September 11th, will, will a, a, an event like September 11th ever happen again in the United States? just like it did the first time. It will never happen like that, right? Why? Because it's now in our context. September 11th, I was teaching, um, I was teaching social studies, interestingly enough, right? And in, um, in the office, they had the TV going so they could do the news in the morning and, and whatnot, and um, 21. Plane two. Well, like, what just happened? It was we could have never imagined that they would that people would use a, a, a plane as a missile with people on the plane. That's something that we never could imagine, right? But now, can we imagine underwear bombs? Yeah, we can imagine that. Shoe bombs, we can imagine that, right? And so now those things are in in our context. Uh, civil rights movement. It took a long time for that, that to unroll. But now, can we and, and don't we mostly use the same kinds of water fountains? Doesn't, it didn't change anything because now in, in, in terms of our humanity, right? So we believe one thing about the difference of our humanity, and now we recognize that the civil rights movement could produce um, some, some key move, uh, places where we can be here. Together, right? Collectively. Um, and then we talked a lot about these human motivations. When we put those in context, those human motivations of safety, significance, and belonging, we can understand people who perceive who, are, who we might perceive to be different from us. And then uh, we'll talk more about the four human behaviors uh, as we kind of go through class. And oh, this is the other thing. What are facts? Facts are what we know today. Facts are what we know today, right now. Um, so what is truth? What is the truth? Truth is the meaning of the facts that we know right now. Right? And so we have to be, uh, to put things in context, we also have to be goal, have a goal-oriented outlook. And we have to act as if. So if this was true about me, what, what does that mean for me? If it's not true about me, what does that mean for me? Right? So when I talk about this idea of facts and, 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 and truth, or, or what is true, so when I was growing up, um, when I was in sixth grade, there were nine planets in the solar system. That was a fact. And what was my truth in 1982 about the planets in the solar system? Was that true? In 1982, that was the truth, that there were nine planets. Right? 
2017. How many planets are there? Eight. That is the truth. Why is that the truth now? Because Pluto has been demoted to, to a, a planetoid. I don't know. Wait, 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 wait. How did they demote Pluto? It's a what? It's a dwarf planet, right? We got a whole new category of planet, right? So facts change, and so does truth. But the ultimate truth, those facts never change. So that truth never changes, all right? My name is Andre. Get out of here. So if I had in 1982, if I had put there were eight planets, I would have had that. I don't even know. I'm not a Going too fast? Am I hec Am I too hectic? Right. 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 Right.
No problem. You have a great day too.